Well, hello, everyone. John Reed, Enterprise Month in Review, Return to Office Blowout Edition, and I'm joined by the Tarmac Tested, Brian Summer. How you doing? <laughs> yeah, I'm fine, but, you know, I, I don't know about the rest of the people on some of these planes I've been on lately, but, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, man, it's uh, it's it's a little bit skirmishy out there, but but Brian, we got to hit the ground to get to get the lessons to bring to the peeps. So, okay. so and and also every month we share our top stories and also kind of the most cringy things that we've run into along the way as well. So we want to give folks that snapshot of what's hot and not. And we have a special guest. This one's actually kind of interesting because this is someone that you and I have have never met, um, but we have a, a guest from Atlassian, and we're going to be talking about uh, their out, outspoken return to work policy, uh, and that's going to be really fun. So, um, And that's going to be in about 15 minutes. That's Molly Sands, who heads up their team Anywhere Lab. So sh- Molly will be joining us shortly. But before then, we are going to dive in, and as always, a reminder that you're part of the show with your outspoken and snarky comments. So please keep those flowing as we go, including your top stories of the month, because we want to dig a little deeper here. We don't want to just accept the spoon-fed vendor narrative. Now, do we, Brian? Never. No. Okay. And and you saw me in action last week at one vendor's event where, of course, I had to ask oh, the, yeah. pes- the pesky question. And um, you brought the salt, you brought the spices. And here, and you also brought a slide deck, so you're a man of many hats. Mm. And this is our agenda today. So we're going to dive right in. And Brian, we are, we are at the yeah, heard, cringy yeah. buzzwords edition. What you got here? I heard some new one, a couple new ones this week. I had never heard of mansplaining as a service. I thought that's a uh, wow. That's that's a definite one where uh, it popped up on a panel and uh, obviously someone objected to the way one of the panelists was talking. And I thought that's a great term. Uh, I can't, I don't think he'll be able to charge for it but because uh, I can't see anybody really wanting it. But anyway, it was a nice term. The other one I heard was yo-yoing between systems. And that was someone describing how data was flowing all over a professional services firm until they finally got a PSA product, professional service automation solution to stop that kind of stuff from going on. Uh, And I've been particularly torqued this week because it seems like everywhere I turn around, people now have decided that learnt is the word we're going to use instead of learned. Uh, Uh, I I don't understand that, but, uh, you know, I'm going to have I haven't learned that yet, but I will work on it. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to how to slip that into a Diginomica piece and hope Stuart doesn't, oh. you know, flag it. You know, but anyway. Oh my God, man! Yeah, Stuart Wolf. Stuart might might red cap you for that one. Uh, I've got I've got a I've got a few of my own that didn't um, make this screen because I didn't forward them to you. But my my few are um, if you say this phrase on a webinar that I'm watching on YouTube, I will stop watching. It's double click. As in, let's double click on that. Oh my <laughs> God, why? Why is that necessary at any point in time to say that? I really would like to know. Um, my other one is I'm still working on banning the the term copilot and the use in discussing AI. Um, that's not going very well for me, as you can tell. <laughs> in fact, it seems like just about every product is named copilot. So I'm my wildly unsuccessful campaign to ban, ban this word continues. Uh, but I did look up the definition, and a co-pilot does have to be able to fly the plane if the pilot is incapacitated. Tell me one AI system that can currently do that. Thank you. And um, the third one is one that I have no idea what it is. So I'm going to have to look it up later, but I just saw the buzzword climate mobility. I have no idea what that is. Um, maybe it's just climate, like running for climate mobility. Climate mobility, okay. Yeah. But maybe it's got something to do with like running for cover when a storm hits, but I feel like it's got to be more than that. Anyway, those well, are my buzzwords. On. Oh, hold on. I got to go back to your second one on co-pilot because when all this AI hoopla in 2023 was kicking off, when people started to talk about co-pilot, the whole concept was it had to be a human being who was double checking, you know, the content. And now you got all these tech companies where they they use the term as if the technology or the AI tool is the co-pilot. And they're ass backwards on this deal because if you want to stop the... um, you want to stop 
uh, hallucination, other kind of problems from uh, causing lawsuits for your firm. You need a human being to double check that stuff. Anyway, that's just no me. doubt, no doubt. And I'm a precisionist when it comes to AI, not an optimist or pessimist. I insist on precision of terminology. And that term is not precise. And Martin Fisher has my back. He says, fully agree about Copilot. So excellent, Martin. Welcome to the movement. It's a little lonely in the anti-Copilot movement. So I'm glad to have you on the show and in, in my movement. So thank you for that. Well, to Martin and John, uh, could I at least nominate myself as flight engineer? I know they don't have those on planes anymore, but they used to be quite common in the day when you had a three-person flight deck. Anyway, let's I'll go. Settle, to I'll settle for AI flight attendant at this point. Um, but uh, <laughs> anyhow, <laughs> on we go to our top stories. Uh, hmm. We'll run through as many as possible before Molly joins us. Um, Brian, we'll start with yours. I don't know which one you'd prefer because you have a few slides. So. Yeah, well, I'm going to kick I'm going to kick a couple of them here, but uh this one I thought was really interesting in that um uh I, I've I've written a little bit about this issue and I was thrilled to see that Harvard kind of picked up on something I'd covered in late last year where um when you have all these AI tools out there and you, uh, whether those are bots that um that are used as part of um uh you know uh, the applicant tracking kind of process, they're kicking out so many super qualified people. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. And they're hurting people, not really helping them. You know, the things are not very smart. And you've got too many people gaming things now. And you can see this here that um, the numbers of people that are using tools uh, to generate applications is just skyrocketing. I think we talked last month about the one guy that used an AI tool to apply to 5,000, 5,000 technology positions in one week using a generative AI tool. Mm. So the bots are out of control, frankly. And I think the HR people and particularly the recruiters have clearly lost the battle already. And they better do something quick if they want to regain control of things. All right. That's top story number one. This now. one. Uh, this is a fascinating concept here. Uh, this from MIT Sloan, and they're talking about false positives, false negatives when it comes to evaluating new technology like the AI stuff. So let's take the um, let's take a uh, if you have a fraud detection tool using machine language and artificial intelligence, and uh, when people are building the business case on why we need to bring this technology in, they generally look at it like, look how much more efficient it's going to make us. And they're not uh, looking at, but what happens if it automatically flags something as being potentially fraudulent? Like, let's say you're out overseas and your credit card transactions denied because it incorrectly created a false, in this case, a false, uh, false positive. It assumed. It was looking for fraud. It flagged your transaction fraud and turned out not to be. Or it could do the other way around. Uh, and a good example of this is in the ATS world. We're always evaluating how much it, how much we can save by having the ATS throw out a huge numbers of potential job seekers. But no one's asking the question like, what does it cost our firm if we really let a good candidate not get through the ATS? What is that cost? And that should be factored into the cost-benefit analysis of these new tools. The same thing is, what is the cost of letting a pure, a previously undetected recruiting error get all the way through uh, for like an interview? And, and I would add to this, what's the opportunity cost that the firm loses out on some great person because their tools flagged all the wrong people to go through the process? And anyway, well, Brent, Brent says he's glad that didn't happen to him at Papacitos at Dow, Dow Forest Worth at DU as well. So, yeah, yep. that would have been a close call um, if that had happened there. Yeah, uh, Brent and I have shared a great bite there at the Papacitos. I'm going to give a nice plug for them. They always have outstanding food and and the like. They hit, they hit us up on social media afterwards, too. That oh, was, yeah. Big hat tip um, there. Martin, uh, um, you said it makes sense to introduce them for AI to stop the hallucinations. Maybe you could elaborate on what you mean um, for for them. Um, that would be cool. And um, so, so 
so I would say too that false positives are totally out of control and it's not art sorry folks but it's not artificial intelligence to flag me across creation every time you think that I might have logged into a new device that's not that's not optimal AI that's just firing off protect your ass uh, bullets and I don't appreciate it when it's wrong so mm-hmm. we got to get that we got to get this thing right because it can be very useful as you point out I mean fraud detection is very helpful so I'm not knocking it um, Brian, you only have about two more minutes for the rest of your top stories, but we can get back to them after as well. Yeah, you can, yeah we'll so, bounce past them there. Yeah, keep going. Is there anything else you want to talk about now? or you go um, Because I can go nah, into just, mine real quick. Okay, go. I'm just I'm just going to I'm just going to give you um, give you all just my real quick take on on why the Apple Vision Pro story is kind of worth watching a little bit. Um, and I I liked Ron Miller's piece here because Ron's a a good enterprise reporter at, at TechCrunch. He lives about thirty minutes away from me, by the way. And I never see him around town. I only see him like in San Francisco. But um, but Ron, you know, g- gave the headset a try. But I think what's what's interesting is it's obviously going to be a stunning device for certain kinds of entertainment scenarios. And and you know, Apple fan peeps are going to give it a go. Those that love Apple are going to try it. But the whole question around is this going to be a mainstream device? I think it's the wrong question to be asking because no one's going to wear that goofy stuff all over the place. It's not going to happen. Um, but I think what's really interesting, um, you know, Apple is determined that this be a productivity device. They call it spatial computing, not virtual or augmented reality. And I think what's going to be interesting is to look, it's not going to mainstream right now. It's it's too bulky and expensive and stuff like that. But I think it's going to be interesting to look at the niche enterprise use cases where it actually does help people, especially in, you know, hands-free capacities, for example. So just like Google Glass had some industry play, I think Apple's going to have some industry play around this. And then the next piece uh, talked about this sort of black mirror scenario of all these people posting these insane, um, you know, videos of them doing crazy stuff. Although I thought the most revealing one was the guy who went to the bar wearing it and how that went for him. Um, I'll I'll give you a hint. He didn't go home um, with social success that night. Oh, okay. So, um, uh, on that non-enterprise note, I want to start introducing um, Molly White. And, and Brent says, yeah, that Sridhar, who's the CEO of Zoho, thinks it will have a place in the business world. I think it will, but it's going to be um, more niche-y. And I, and, I, and I think that's going to be a good discussion, separate from this obsession of whether it mainstreams or not. So, uh, we're just about to bring Molly Sands on. Before we bring Molly on, I just want to set this up briefly. We rarely have people from a vendor on these shows. But how do you get there? By taking bold stances backed up by compelling data. And in this case, what we got was a piece by my colleague, Phil Wainwright on Atlassian. And Atlassian's recently published um, piece on lessons learned 1,000 days of distributed work at Atlassian. And some really cool, interesting statements about the future of work and how it's not going to be about mandating people to come for work. And the reason I think this is so timely right now, and Brian will provide more color as we go, is the amount of return to office mandates that are being imposed right now. And you have Atlassian kind of going in a very different direction. Uh, and, but at a certain scale, this is not a small organization anymore. And um, later, there was a really compelling quote in the same article around this moment of remote work. And we were very much contrarian, says Atlassian, in our approach saying you no longer have to come into our physical office. It's not just for 15 days or one month, it's forever. We will make sure this is how we will work as a company going forward. This was very unusual because most companies were already planning their return to office strategies, bingo. And that was from an internal program, Atlassian, called Team Anywhere that started three years ago. And we are now glad to have as a very last minute guest on our program, Molly Sands, who actually leads this team. So we're going to find out directly. Molly, let's see how it's going with your audio and video because we haven't done a test. How are you doing? Okay. Hi, John. How are you? Hey. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you good. Uh, you coming out loud and clear. So so first of all, congrats on putting out a compelling report like that with a compelling point of view. And we're really glad to have you on to hear a little more about your experiences. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so, to be here. so bring us back maybe a little bit to to how this team anywhere got started three years ago and just how your positions at Alassian around the the future of work for your company evolved. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I have a very untraditional job title leading the Team Anywhere Lab here at Atlassian. Um, About three years ago, a little more now, I guess, um, in August of 2020, we decided that we were really going all in on fully distributed and that we would not be requiring people to come back to the office. And we've held to that. We don't have any office mandates. We have about 11,000 employees at Atlassian today and 11 offices that we operate around the globe. Um, And we do see that people come to those offices. They choose to when it works for them, but it is truly their choice each and every day where they want to work from. I'm actually in our San Francisco office today, um, meeting with my team for some things this morning. That's really interesting. And one of the things that I've wanted to see is like, if, if you could conduct a more open experiment why would people come to the office, right? Because there were all these kind of horror stories around these return to office mandates where it's like, yeah, I returned to my office and I was doing like Zoom meetings all day long from my desk, right? Right. So what what are you all actually learning about what the office is actually good for? Is it more like kind of role-based and age and culture-based or is it more like certain kinds of things that are more effective in an office capacity? Yeah, so we see a couple really interesting things in terms of who chooses to come to the office and why they come. Uh, We do see some life stage differences. So our early career, recent college grad hires tend to like to spend more time here. Our folks that live farther out that are going to be spending a lot of time commuting when they come in, maybe have families, have other caregiving responsibilities, they often tend to not come as as much. But people really do want to connect when they're in the office. And so we've designed a lot of our spaces to make it possible for teams to come on site in much bigger groups. We see bigger groups of people often coming together and wanting to spend that time. We also have found this really important need for more virtual collaboration spaces. I think we've all had the moment where you're like in a phone booth for way more hours than you ever thought you were going to be when you first stepped in there. And so we've been thinking and uh, designing new spaces in New York, in Sydney, um, in a lot of in Austin, in different office locations, to really help support that need for people to work with others that are in different locations, even on their office days, and that's been a really consistent pattern too. So, real quick, go ahead. Brian. Uh, I've got a Fortune article here in front of me, and it says the following: We also saw that an organization's decision to require in-office work represents a financial burden for employees. The average employee returning the office spends $561 per month on transportation, additional child and pet care, and domestic assistance. That is comparable to the average two-person household's grocery bill in the United States for the entire month. Did you hear any of that from the people that you talked to for your study? So we've done a lot of uh, a lot of research with folks in and outside of Atlassian about their experience and what they want from work. And what we find is that most people really do want that flexibility and choice, but they also want the opportunity to, to connect. So one of the things that we're hearing from um, folks who are fully remote and located more than two hours away from our offices is that they'd like to travel a few times a year. They would, they're would they interested in coming together with people, um, but they don't want to necessarily be, they don't need to do that every day. And we find in our research that that's really supported, that team connection can stay really strong over long periods of time. Since we have a flexible policy and people get to decide when they come for to our offices, um, the cost burden isn't on the individuals. We pay for the travel when they're joining for intentional togetherness events. Um, and there's a lot of amenities and options when they do choose to spend time in the office. But it's certainly something we're thinking about and how we make it equitable and accessible to everyone if this is an environment that works well for them or if there's moments where they need to come together with their teams. So isn't a big part of this issue the fact that a lot of leaders are dealing in absolutes? It's either 100% work remote or it's 100% work from the office. And uh, it doesn't seem like uh, there's a lot of common sense going on that maybe we need to come up with something that's a little bit more uh, flexible and maybe hits things in the middle. Yeah, we hear a few key concerns and these are things that we all that we address in the distributed work thousand days of distributed work report 
We hear a lot of concerns about productivity. We hear a lot of concerns about connection. Can we build relationships? We hear concerns about culture. We hear a lot of concerns about real estate costs. Uh, These are kinds of the things that come up as what will we do? How will we solve them? And we don't see a lot of support that these are huge unsolvable problems in the data. And so I think a lot of what's happening in the world of return to office um, is really people going back to things that are comfortable and familiar for them. The things that are broken about work today do not magically resolve when you walk into an office. It's the back-to-back-to-back meetings, the lack of clarity in goal, people not feeling like they have the right information to do their job. They don't necessarily know how to who to work with on things. These are the types types of things we hear a lot from executives. My team has done some really interesting work with uh, Fortune 500 executives to see how they're thinking about the future of work. And they very openly acknowledge that they think the future of work is going to continue to be distributed. Um, And when I say distributed, I mean that people are working together online, right? So it's not a controversial thing in any enterprise or business at scale distributed is going to be part of your work model. The moment that people are able to send emails from home, that became distributed work in some form. And so it's really about targeting and fixing the things that are challenging for teams. Um, But many of those exist wherever you are. And so our approach at Atlassian has very much been to focus on how we work and collaborate together and to use our products and tools. I mean, we make digital collaboration tools We need to make sure that those support teams and being able to work together effectively wherever they are. I'm hoping out of self-interest that you can help me destroy, I don't know your view on this, so we'll find out, a stereotype that you can't build culture remotely. uh, Because I think that's one of the biggest BS talking points of the return to office mandate people. So can, can we dismantle that? Can you help me? Yeah, I am. I am absolutely with you. I don't know where this comes from. The idea that you can't build relationships, that you can't pick up signals online. We have such rich communication technology these days that that's absolutely not true. There's no evidence of this. We measure our culture at Atlassian. We're winning awards for our culture at Atlassian without ever requiring anyone to spend time in the office. One of the things that I love that we do is every new employee writes an intro blog. Um, They publish it internally. We have a system within Confluence that allows them to share these blogs. And they just write about themselves and what their journey's been like and what they do in their time outside of work. And they share that with the whole organization. Everyone can see them. It's just such a great way when you're working with someone new Um, to get a sense of what people are like. And we really use a lot of different kinds of asynchronous tools to help us connect and collaborate. And I feel like this sounds like a tiny bit ad-like, which is really not my intent. But we recently purchased Loom. And Loom is a video communication platform where you can record yourself. And you can have a much richer um, interaction with someone, even if you're not working at the same time. So my team did some experiments recently where we had managers record looms to recognize the accomplishments of their team. And we found that there was a massive boost, like over a 30% boost in how appreciated people felt and how connected to that manager they felt. And this was over and above the results we saw from a similar thing where we had people do written updates. And so the culture is not where you are. The culture is the people, right? And the relationships you build with them and the ways you connect. Um, And I think that's really clear in so much of the work that we've done, but also in the experience of living the day-to-day culture of a company. Um, It doesn't go away if you're not all in the same position. Brent Leary says the pandemic proved people could do the work from wherever they happen to be. Trying to force them back is going to be tough, especially if they have to spend two or three hours each day getting back and forth to the office. Companies out to work with employees don't know how to use that time effectively. I don't think forcing them to go back is going to work, which brings me to an interesting point around, in theory, if you're right about this, and I happen to think you are, the it's going to prove out in your results, right? Because you're going to have superior results recruiting and retaining talent if 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 this is correct, right? And and you know, for example, I think I want to just put this out there because, like, 
for example, immunocompromised people don't want to be in offices all the time. And I'm sick of people not accepting that and trying to pretend like that doesn't matter anymore because it does matter to some people. And at, at times this last couple of years, that's mattered to me. So so if if you can recruit people and overcome those kinds of obstacles creatively, it seems to me you're going to have a talent advantage. Are you seeing any signs of that yet? Yeah, we are. So we have about twice as many applicants um, for every role as we did previously. We've had about a 20% boost in offer accept rates, and we've made some really great progress in terms of increasing diversity as well. So for instance, in India, we have about twice as many women employees as we did prior to introducing Team Anywhere. Wow, cool. Well, I'll pile in on that. Uh, There's a couple of things here you've touched on. One is there are managers and bosses and executives who come from an old way of uh, thinking and training and uh, they're probably behind the eight ball on getting up to speed on how to actually run and manage effectively a remote workforce. They never took a course in that. They don't know what to do, or they've just been willfully ignorant, not wanting to try. It. That's one. Number two, you've got some of them who are stuck and running a business in a nostalgic way. You know, they have that. Well, that's the way we always did it until this pandemic. And just a knee-jerk reaction to go back to without having learned anything, again, shows a deficiency on the part of management. And, you know, so I think there's a there's a problem with the leadership in a lot of firms, and then they can't tell you why they need to go there. I know talk, I talked to a lot of, it, of uh, people in the accounting profession, and there's a huge issue with a lot of um, – CFOs and controllers think that because they had to work like dogs and had to be in the office five, six, seven days a week, every week for their whole career when they were in a big four firm, that everyone else that works for them has to be the same way. Again, it's a it's a mindset or training perspective that some of these executives had that just hasn't kept up with the times. Um, and I don't know how companies, I don't know if your research touched on this, about how do companies claim to have a great personal, professional balance, work-life balance kind of deal when they make people give up two, three, whatever hours every day on the commute uh, that they don't really need to do. I mean, how is that How is that work-life balance? Yeah, I think one of the challenges is that people can't unlearn that they can work from lots of locations and be really successful and effective, right? So that's sort of, that secret is out, if you will. Um, and as we try to, as companies try to bring people back to the office, there is going to be this resistance because a lot of those decisions have been emotional and driven in, um, you know, driven by a lot of concerns that are often not backed by data. And so our approach at Atlassian is that we are really leaning into the data to make these decisions. And we have a lot of evidence that it's working. We don't see any drops in productivity or commitment. I think there's a bit of a myth around remote workers not working hard. That's not true. It's not something that we see any evidence of. Um, But really, we've focused in a lot on the how to work. How do we make goals really, really clear for people? How do we help hold them accountable to those goals? How do we make sure we have the right systems in place so information is flowing really well? Um, but overall, we we hear from executives that only about a third of them think that the in-office policies that they've mandated have had any impact on productivity. Um, I don't know how much of that is driven by data, but that's two thirds of people saying like, yeah, this isn't really working quite how we thought it would. And that really is at the core of this we have to acknowledge that any company at scale is working in a distributed way. And so let's just fix the things that are really actually broken about how we work. Let's get really clear yeah. on what we need to focus on and deliver. Let's and for the record, how many employees at Alessia? Uh, about 11,000. 11,000. So yeah, that's a great remote work use case at scale. Um, I also just want to add real quickly that I think another major unproductive motivator for companies is, is trying to rationalize their overextended real estate footprints that are essentially legacy real estate footprints. And my advice there is take the financial hit and move on um, because you're going to have to at some point anyway. <laughs> so yeah, um, we have a lot of information about how we handled real estate in the guide too. If, if folks, Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a potent topic. 
Um, so I want to try to poke at the weaknesses in my own argument by asking you the questions that I have the hardest time answering around this issue. I think I think the two most legitimate criticisms around this type of flexible remote strategy are one, you know, what about you know people that that struggle with more remote and you know, are away from the office or they're younger and they need more social interaction. I think you've solved a lot of that by creating more flexibility, you know, and I would also add sometimes maybe decentralized office locations with shorter commutes, different things like that or could be part of the answer in the long-term co-working spaces, different creative ways of engaging people locally so they don't get as lonely. I think that's a solvable criticism. The one that I think is a little trickier that I love to hear your take on is this one around that people that are in the office more have some inherent advantages when it comes to office politics and the politics of workplace advancement and things like that. And that one, I do admit that I struggle with a little bit more because I think like people who are specialist hired gun types can, can succeed for a very long time without being around the office much. But if your goal is really C-suite advancement, that's where I do see this being a little bit trickier. And, but maybe that's more like that people who really want that, just spend more time in the office. But it also kind of gives me the creeps to think that that organizations would apply merit based on proximity to the water cooler. Uh, it, it feels like a sucking up culture, not a good culture. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think about this a lot, a lot, because there are definitely... Uh, there's definitely a risk of creating a two-tier system, right? Where you have like office employees that get all the great opportunities. Proximity bias can be a real thing. Um, But I think the solve is in the ways of working. If people have extremely clear goals, they know what they need to do to be successful and effective, and you're really measuring how they deliver those outcomes, that helps a lot in leveling that playing field. If you really are clear on this is what these teams are doing and how successful they've been at it. Um, And we really build all of our work practices around being virtual first. So we have um, ways that we facilitate meetings center on having written content at Atlassian. Mm. So you'll have pages that you review together. Everything always has uh, a way to join virtually. We have this ITG program, which is our intentional togetherness gatherings. We bring people together to focus on building those relationships. And we really encourage them to focus on relationships when that's yeah. when they are together. And so I think there's a lot of ways you can set your company up to p- support the relationship that need to be in place to make it so the evaluation criteria you're using for teams and people is not as subject to bias. And we keep an eye on these metrics. So we look to make sure that mm-hmm. we're not in fact, you know, promoting people at different rates based on their choices of where they work. That's a good point. That last point. Brian? Well, I think what's interesting is when I, to your, one of your concerns, uh, John, was uh, do people have to be there in the office or anything else? Well, you're right. That sounds like that's a culture of toadyism in a company mm-hmm. that you have to have. Um, yeah. Th- th- there's I, our I've quote, run, quote of the day right there. I've, I've run into that in more than a few companies, unfortunately, which is what concerns me. But yeah, Right. And But again, I'll go back to there are deficiencies in the leadership suite in a lot of companies. If you want to mentor people, if you want to groom and grow the ne- your bench, I mean, the whole job of a top executive is to develop the people underneath them in a way that any one of them could fill in for you uh, whenever your time is up in the company. But for many firms and many executives, they don't do that because they don't want to rival possibly for their own position, you know, just beneath them in the org structure somewhere. And that's a real problem. Oh, there we go. Josh got that. Yeah, Josh likes your culture of toadyism. He's going to take that and run with it. So I, I, I suspect we're going to see that in some piece. Josh is going to work up quite yep, soon. I think yeah. so. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, anyway, I, I was just going to point out to me, a lot of this is around uh, it's about bad managers with bad techniques who haven't thought through how to reimagine their job in light of a virtual work world. Uh, they, they just haven't done the mental work to figure out what that means. And, and this is a personal thing for me because I deployed you know, virtual work when I was at Accenture in the 90s. So I've, I, know what that, I know what that's about. And the first thing is, if you don't trust your own people, that's one big problem right there. And number two is you have to have a mechanism to ping them, stay in touch with them, 
and know what's going on um, and whatever mechanism that takes place. And sometimes you don't even have to do the virtual, I mean, the in-office stuff in the office. I would have division meetings, quarterly meetings. I'd have them hold them all over the place uh, someplace cool and fun. Yeah, so I never had people arguing about, oh, I got to go to the office because the question was, oh, I got to go to, I don't know, Steamboat Springs or Vail or whatever. You know, it's like, who's going to argue with going there for, you know, for a day or two's worth of work? Nobody. Anyway. Indeed. I want to work in Martin's question for Molly and then we'll we'll wrap up this segment in just a little bit. Martin's, um, Martin says he thinks the pandemic proved that productivity is not going down. He assumes idea ge generation and innovation is better if you do ideation in one one room. And and I'll, I'll just make the observation that one of the things that I found interesting talking with companies that have experimented with this is that it seems like the number one surprising thing is how much like just being social with each other matters. And so a lot of companies that I've talked to, it's the social events that actually are the big draws for coming together. But I do think certain kinds of collaborative, creative exercises can go really well in the same room, right? When you're brainstorming and stuff like that. What do you think about Martin's question, Molly? Yeah. So there is some really good, robust research that's not from me or Atlassian um, around people being able to be very creative independently and having those moments to create apart and together being super important. So I don't think we actually have any evidence that, you know, innovation is is dead if you're not in the same place. Um, people can be very creative asynchronously. We do a lot of that collaboration of, you know, here's a place where we're all going to collect our ideas. Um, but there are moments where you can get really great momentum and build really strong relationships in person that I think then foster that creativity and psychological mm. safety that really help people come to the table with new ideas and new perspectives on things. Um, and so that's where we do strategically bring people together. We're definitely not anti-in-person time. We think it matters and that it's important. It just doesn't need to be three days a week or Monday, Tuesdays or, you know, whatever this hybrid schedule is. We can do that on a less regular basis. And we see that the benefits tend to last somewhere between three and five months for our team in terms of connection and their ability to get things done fast together. I have one more point, then Brian, I'll turn it over to you for the last one. Um, okay. the, the other thing, the other point that I thought came out in your article that I think is a really strong point is to some extent, I think this is an unfortunate debate, this return to office versus flexible, because I think it's not the right framing. I think the proper framing is your framing around the digital teamwork isn't going away, right? That, that primarily we're going to do our work in digital mode and collaboration mode. So you, like I referred to earlier, you could be in the office and still be on Zoom and Slack all day long and stuff like that. And and so to me, let's have a conversation about that because because digital work, if if it, it can take a wrong turn and become a series of like micromanaged KPIs and workplace surveillance vibes and and in, in the wrong hands, that can be a real detriment to feeling like you're a part of something meaningful. And then you think about things like that you referred to about synchronous versus asynchronous work and getting that balance right. And then also protecting that deep work time is a really big thing that I care about of like, how do you protect an employee who, who really needs that one day a week if they're going to come up with high value deliverables where no one interrupts them or bothers them at all. And like, to me, those things can be structured into a proper digital workflow, but not out of the box. You have to work on that. And so I want to have that conversation. What do you think, Molly? Yeah, that's the exact conversation that I want to have and the whole goal of my team. So we're really taking an evidence-based approach to designing and validating the new best practices, right? There's no playbook for this. Most people don't know how to do this really, really well. And so our goal is in it, what we're learning from our own journey at Atlassian is to help people and equip them with the right products and practices to be able to do that. Cool. Brian, last one, man. What do you got? So just for some of the listeners who didn't know, uh, they may not know Atlassian, but they probably know one of your key products, Jira. Uh, and uh, I'll just get, going to give you a little plug, uh, you know, for that. But anyway, what I want to know is... Um, are, are there one or two things you wish uh, your firm had done either differently or better, maybe in its path to going to remote work that uh, you'd want to pass along or share with other folks? It's not to say you did something wrong, but maybe you didn't do it either soon enough or you wish you'd done a little bit different. What do you think? Yeah. So I haven't been at Atlassian for their entire distributed journey. 
Um, I and so I'm sure folks that were here in the very beginning would um, say different things. The thing I think they did really incredibly well and very in a differentiated way was how seriously they took it. And they built a lot of programming and support. And we have, you know, a full team of people that this is their full time job is to think about how we do this well. But there's definitely things that are tricky. We're still working on what the programming should be like for folks that are earlier in their career that do want more of that in op- some of them want more of that in office time. Um, and so we're thinking, we're thinking about that. We're trying and piloting new approaches there. Um, and then time zones is the other thing I would say is really important. We mm-hmm. do, I know I mentioned a little bit this balance of synchronous and asynchronous. With synchronous, I just mean we're actively collaborating back and forth in real time. With asynchronous, it's the kind of work that I can do that benefits others later. They don't have to be actively present at that moment. But we do find that people need about four hours of overlapping work time. About half their day should be uh, the same hours as the p- folks they work with most, which may or may not you know, be their official team. Um, and that's, that's really important. And so I would recommend for companies that are early in on this journey to be thinking about making sure people have that ability in the way that you structure teams. Excellent. And, and Brent said uh, that uh, just in terms of it will be interesting to see if companies who have a work from anywhere policy were able to snake better talent than companies with rigid must come in organizations. I agree. And it will be interesting to see if Atlassian succeeds. I appreciate the proof points that you've given us and given me that I can take forward in my arguments because I can I can only make the argument from Diginomica. We are not 11,000 employees. So you have given me some fodder that I can really use. So I, I really appreciate that. And any final things you wanted to mention that we didn't cover? Yeah, I'm so glad. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, um, and thanks for jumping on last minute. It was only a few days ago that we reached out to y'all. So that's super impressive. And I did paste a link into the chat, folks, for Phil's Diginomic article, which also has a link to the report that you can search on as well. So thank you so much, Molly. Have a great weekend. Thank you. It was a pleasure. So, Brian, debrief. What did you make of that? Um, nice to hear a nice story on this. Uh, you know, there's, um, God, we've heard so many horror stories, huh? Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things, uh, we were just starting to touch on an issue there around when you look at the job postings in the market today, the numbers of them that now mention remote work have gone down actually in recent months. Uh, yet the number of applicants applying to those is just off the charts. Nobody wants to apply for a job that's office in office, basically. Uh, those are kind of the, uh, you know, job app, job listings of last resort. Nobody wants those. They want either hybrid or remote. And uh, we didn't get a chance to explore that, but that's one of the other kind of trends that's going on right now. Uh, that's the name, Brent, of the report. Uh, the Alassian report, I think you may have an easier time just searching for that, but I will also, I pasted in the link to um, Phil's article earlier, which can get you right to the report also. Um, so yeah, that's the, and that just came out um, just, just a little while ago. So, um, and you know, it, it's interesting cause like I, I, I don't necessarily think that every company is going to have the same playbook on this. It's just really refreshing to hear a company that's really documenting the proof points around how this can work, but also looking hard at some of the problems too, right? With like, you know, younger employees and issues of advancement and how you deal with all that. Cause I don't want to idealize it. It's not flexible work isn't always easy either. So it was cool to hear that story. Yeah. And that's a good point because uh, most of the things that, you know, I, I mean, seriously, I've got a whole stack of these reports right now. And most of them are done by either like a consulting firm or it's some third party or a magazine, whatever. And I think they capture aspects of the issue. But what's different about having Molly on here is it's her firm that's doing this and documenting it and uh, warts and all. And that's a fascinating approach. Um, It puts a human face to it. I think the other thing that's worth noting is this stuff is multifaceted. It's different depending on who you are and how you're looking at the issue. If you're a new hire, you got a different viewpoint. If you're a senior executive, you have a different perspective and so forth. 
And I think we have to recognize that. So no solution can just be some flippant, you know, we're going back to the office with no subtlety or, you know, um, depth of thought. You've got to make it work out. You've got to put the thinking in to make it really work out well. Well, here's to a competitive workplace with different work models and, and you know, let employees choose the ones that are best for them and let's see where the chips fall out. That's what I say. Um so, Brian, shall we bring our slide deck back and see see yeah, where we ahead. are? All right. So let's we got through we got through Apple Vision already. Um, oh, Martin did have a comment on. Let me see if I can pull that back up real quick. If I can just find that. Uh, oh, he just said he sees a role for it, but but only a niche role anyway. But I still think it's going to be worth kind of watching that a little bit. Um, and then we did Atlassian. Oh, and oh, here here's my here's my whiff. Uh, of the month. I'll actually add two though, because before we do that one, I want to do the one that I got in my inbox that I sent you. Oh, I, I got a nice little startup pitch from an AI driven GPT platform, developed the employee recognition assistant. Uh, and this tool leverages GPT technology to craft personalized recognition messages, creating a culture of appreciation and engagement with an organization. I'm sorry. But that is a horrible AI use case, that Gen AI use case. That is about the worst one I've gotten since the one on uh, identifying mushrooms, which, of course, being wrong on that one is fatal. Um, this is close. I mean, Brian, what do you think? Do you want a GPT based employee? <laughs> Would you have yeah. set that out and set that out to your team when you were running teams? So I knew you wanted to talk about this, and I really, really thought you were going to bring this up when we had Molly on, uh, because um, when you get these, I, I have a real problem with uh, software companies, and I've had this problem for years, that want to sell uh, digital attaboy certificates. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, where the software figured out that, oh, you've just uh, celebrated your third year with the company, and then boom, here comes this. Suitable for framing, digitalized, uh, you know, attaboy uh, certificate. I would, I would chew out my boss like you wouldn't believe if they sent me had one of those sent to me because it, if you don't even have the time to even whether it's type a one line email that just says congrats, you know, on your three year anniversary, or pick up the phone, give me a call, or Maybe offer to take me to lunch that day. You know, it is, you know, it's, it's an important anniversary, but man, to get something like that, you know, dear blank. And John knows I get pitched. Both of us get pitched all the time by PR firms and third parties. And they get my name wrong all the time. Today, again, I was dear brain. I mean, I know they're just transposing <laughs> two letters and I should be flattered, but it pisses me off. Maybe I've they been, just saw the maybe did they just saw the promo I did for the show because I, I have you in his Brian Brain. No, so no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I I get to be Byron, I've been Brienne, I've been all kinds of these things. You know, and if you can't even get my name right, why are you even bothering sending me one of these kind of BS forms or something like that? But yeah, I can't stand those. I would agree with you. This is a um this is an idea whose time should have died on the ideation table and never should have made it forward. I'm ready to, why don't we go back to toadyism and, uh, uh, you know, make us be yeah. software for that, uh, toadyism as a service. There we go. Yeah. I probably should have kept Molly on for that. It would have been really cool to, to get their point of view on that one. I, I I'm guessing that Elastium would not be down with, with, with that use case. And, you know, it, it's just the classic generative AI. I, I call it the AI overreach, but it's basically like overestimating what these systems are, are capable of today. And the other problem that we have is the exaggeration around the impact on, on, on workforces, which is not particularly helpful, which is the width that I have on the screen now, which, uh, which there's been all these um, layoffs this year. And so many of them have been attributed to AI, but in many ways, I think their excuses sort of like for rationalizations for other kinds of workforce changes that may or may not be a good idea. I'm generally not in favor of these types of layoffs, but this one's interesting from Fortune because what happened was the CEO was like, oh, this is an AI-inspired restructuring, whatever. And then um, uh, later, uh, UPS um, was quoted in the article, the CEO, as they walked back those comments that the UPS layoffs were not about that. And so I looked into it a little bit more and it turns out 
Well, one interesting thing is that it doesn't affect blue collar workers at all. And one, one of the aspects of that is that robotics is really hitting some walls when it comes to physical movements, especially unpredictable physical movements like a UPS person moving all over the place. So that's kind of interesting that I would agree that white collar is a little more threatened. But when you read about it and you say, well, well, how are they like rationalizing headcount reductions? Because the current AI really gets rid of tasks more than jobs. And, and it's hard until you have an accumulation of tasks, you can't really reduce headcount. And it's, so anyway, I'm looking at it and like they were bragging about how it's at UPS, it's made generating sales proposals faster. I'm like, wait, so you're able to lay off thousands of people because you can generate? No, you can't. And so we just have to learn how to look at these headlines a little more critically. That's all I'm saying. So John and I were at an, an event for two or three days last week. And uh, and I think the great Josh Greenbaum was down there as well. And what's interesting is you heard a lot of companies talking about they're already using bits and pieces of generative AI as well as other uh, AI and ML tools. Have they done layoffs? No. And to your point, John, uh, they're automating bits and pieces of processes. But the key point here is all of those customers of this software company had expressed concerns about privacy, security, and even the co-pilot, if I could use that word. (laughs) <laughs> uh, kind of issue. Um, but they were taking measured steps. And I want to be real clear, this is going to be like that line out of the book, uh, Ernest Hemingway wrote, The Sun Also Rises, when these two gentlemen are talking, one of them says, how did your company go out of business? And the guy said, slowly at first, and then all of a sudden. So I think the AI job losses, they'll start slowly at first, and then all of a sudden. So a lot of what we're seeing right now is it's it's some kind of perverse way of fobbing off these layoff stories onto AI. They're making AI out as the villain here when it's something else. Uh, probably. And I literally all. found, I found out about this article in the UPS thing by a, a sensationalized YouTube um, media clip of a supposedly legit TV show where they're talking about the AI jobs apocalypse and these pundits saying, Oh, there's going to be an apocalypse and it's coming right up. And, and it's just so incredibly irresponsible. And and unfortunately, the thing with AI is that we all have to study it to understand it because otherwise we're going to propagate the same misinformation. There's just no way around it. You can't have a surface understanding of these issues and be credible. Um, Josh says, um, in order to justify a layoff to AI, you'd have to be able to prove that AI was driving some real productivity gains. We all know how impossible those studies are. He calls BS. Thank you, Josh. It's nice not to be completely lonely on the BS side with with you, me, and Brian. I feel more empowered. And then Martin says, fully agree this AI argument is just an excuse for layoffs. Probably the tech companies just overhired in recent years. I would tend to agree, Martin, that there's a lot of complex reasons for these restructurings. The one thing I do think it actually shows is not the potential of AI, but the intensity of the continued so-called macroeconomic headwinds. And companies are trying to make sense of both enterprises and consumers that are a bit cautious right now across the board. And that's really, I think, what's going on, in my opinion. But that's me. Well, what I love is some of the same companies doing the layoffs are the same companies who are exhorting companies to have human co-pilots watching the output of the AI stuff. So why are they getting rid of all these people that should be double-checking what the AI tool is doing? Anyway, here we go. Talk to the dog. That is oh, one. That dog can inspire some incredible uh, thinking here. Um, so the question of the day, John, what it, what have you got that kind of inspired uh, you or created value, you think, for people out in the market? Have you seen anything of late? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, well, I think I think the discussion today was was one of my big ones because that was why I kind of acted on that. And, and we worked that out for the show because I, I really wanted a positive story and um, they're, they're out there. It's just that the really hard ones to find are the ones at scale. Like, like, cause a lot of the best things in our industry are not operating at scale, but it's exciting to see, um, you know, w- when that happens and you see like that kind of thing in a broader inspirational way, but it like, it's also data driven. That's really exciting for me. So I'm, I'm kind of buzzed on that at the moment. For me, I've got to give a talk in Mumbai in a couple of weeks, and I'm supposed to be talking about transformation and all you know uh, that kind of subject in the greater HR space. 
And I've done a bunch of those kind of projects for clients. And one of the things that's been interesting to me, talk about creates value and inspires, is I've been sharing drafts of what I'm going to cover uh, at this uh, event in this workshop. And the feedback has made me go back and rethink and rethink a number of different things. Not that my stuff was wrong. It's just I need to probably update what the focus is going to be because so many of the new things happening in the market relative to process automation and AI and all that kind of stuff have some additional, if not unintended, but surprising kinds of consequences. So what's it's got me inspired to do more original work around um, what the future of work, to use such a cliched term, actually looks like and how HR functions need to actually be structured if they're going to add value for their employer. Anyway, that's it on mine. Yeah, I like that. And it, it's it's cool. I'm not going to name the vendors because some of them are Diginomica, Diginomica partners, but we've been to some recent shows that uh, that were cool to hear business users telling cool stories about, you know, adapting software, customizing, making things work well for them. Great mobile apps, enterprise mobile apps. That kind of stuff is cool because 10 or 20 years ago, enterprise tech and enterprise user experience really sucked. And and now there's so many vendors that are making it possible to do to do more in a more user-friendly way. So I really like that. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that we don't have a whole host of really difficult issues to talk about. And so for me, like, I don't know about you, but I, what I like is a combination of forward-thinking customer stories and then frank, open conversations with e- executives and with peers like yourself around the problems. And, and it, those are great. And especially if you can do them in person where people are being really open, you, you can't put a price on that. That's worth every single tarmac that I have to sit on. So I'll add to that kind of observation. We, I had an opportunity last week, you did too, I think, to go. I don't think you got to do it, though. Got to go out to the Boca Chica site for SpaceX. No, I did not go to SpaceX, yeah. Uh, but... Uh, uh, you know, I'm a real big believer in get out away from the office, get out from behind the desk, go out and see things, play in traffic and kind of get your mind kind of blown, if you will, and see what's going on. And that facility was interesting. It was a lot of it was what I expected because I grew up near the barrier islands of Texas. I kind of know what that landscape's like. But I wasn't expecting to see giant rocket ships, uh, you know, in different stages of assembly. Um, it was an active construction site. I knew we weren't going to be able to get into too much, but to see what's going on there by a private company is rather mind blowing. Um, anyway, um, uh, you talk about something that I, I want to say it's somewhat inspiring, uh, but it's, uh, it's more awe inspiring to see mm. that kind of an expenditure going on and the kind and the sheer numbers of people involved over there. And maybe in the spirit of uh, full disclosure, I will admit that my son does work for SpaceX. So, uh, you know, there may be some parental kind of uh, whatever um, halo effect here, but I'm glad I got to see that facility. Anyway. I think- yeah, Albert, Albert, Albert Camus, in a paraphrase, he had a quote that I always liked. He said, I feel humility in my heart of hearts only in the face of the greatest works of imagination, e.g. SpaceX type things, rockets, <laughs> and, and the most abject forms of human poverty. In between the two is a society I find ludicrous. Anyway, um, Josh says, worth the tarmac, I sat on a new KPI for the harried analyst. <laughs> Absolutely, Josh. Why not, man? Let's put that in a dashboard and send it to all the vendors. You know, uh, look uh, at look at look at your sentiment ratio in real time, man. Your time that time starting to edge out over your content, the quality of your content. Whoops. I, I'm not too thrilled about tarmac time as a metric, but I will <laughs> tell you that it was quality time spent in like DFW uh, when Brent and I got to go to uh, Papacitas. We actually had time to have a nice, enjoyable dinner, and I watched him power through this uh, his meal, and he had a big old uh, dish, and um, that was uh, that was nice. It really was. So I don't I, I don't get that on the tarmac. I get that in the terminal. So anyway enough on that distinction. Absolutely. Well, thanks uh, to a few of our vigorous commenters for keeping it real in the chat as usual. Um, Brian, I really enjoyed 
this one. This was a real keeper. Thanks for the lovely slide deck and the excellent conversations as always. Love doing these. All right. Yep. I guess that says we're that's done for this month. Is that what I'm hearing? Yep. Yep. We're a wrap for this time. We'll see y'all next month. All right. Bye-bye.